Hi, I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network. So today we have our Frack Spread show. So we've already done a lot on the econ show that came out today. So we'll try to keep it light on, on, the, uh, on the econ side. We did get some new numbers that we'll talk about briefly and then obviously go into more detail next week. But today we really want to hone in on what is happening in the U.S. and then what's happening in, in uh, Russia in terms of some of the things that are transpiring given the different uh, components of how is Europe going to replace their crude? Can they replace that crude? At what cost? Because I think there's a lot of uh, different pieces that fall within that puzzle. So before we uh, we get into it, we want, we want to look at the uh, frac spread count, which fell by six. So before everyone panics, uh, it's very important to understand there's typically a dip for that for Easter spring break. So again, this is not, this is very normal. You normally kind of get this dip and then you get that spring load that then carries you through the uh, pretty much till August at this point. You know, typically you have a li that little bit of a lull and then obviously people go away for the, uh, the holidays, there's spring break, there's a lot of things that come in. So very much seasonally okay, nothing to worry about. Uh, and and the, but to be clear, some of the uh, most of the drop was in some of the smaller basins like Fort Worth, uh, San Juan. Like again, that's where we saw some of that drop. Uinta, where when you look at the big basins that we've been talking about, the Permian still running hot. That we don't see that slowing down. Western Gulf, Williston, Texas, Louisiana, um, uh, M Mississippi Salt. All of those key areas are really still running. Uh, you know, Anadarko had a drop, but uh, there's, again, some of those pieces are just going to come back on a seasonal basis. So there's really nothing uh, that is abnormal in this number. So we do see 290 as very likely as we get to the end of April, first week of, uh, of May. It's just that last 10 is going to take some time because, again, wh where are you going to get the pipe? Where are you going to get a lot of the uh, logistics that we've been talking about as you have OCTG pipe that has gone up again? And I, which is, if you look around the world, especially when you look at what's happening in Germany and other places, it's unlikely that those prices are coming back down. So then when you start taking that and looking at what is happening on the rig side, so rigs need to continue to work because the duck count is really going to be so pivotal as we get ready for that, again, that kind of final bounce that will then carry us into the end, uh, you know, pretty much through the summer months. So when you look, you look at the U.S., the U.S. had an increase of four, two oil, two gas. And when it's important because five horizontals. You had one vertical coming down. That's fine. It's really the, the horizontal that continue to drive higher. So we still get that activity. And when you look at the spreads uh, between when where uh, you know rigs to uh, to, to uh, frac spreads, it's down to about 0.38. And we talk about we're going to talk about this more in the insights later uh, tomorrow because unfortunately I wasn't able to get it done. I apologize, but you will have it on Friday. So when you look at what is happening, you can see that there's kind of that normal dip, and then we're going to start to see that spread get a little bit tighter when you start looking at the frac spreads picking back up because we don't see rigs coming down. And again, rigs are going to continue to grind higher, try to build up uh, you know, some of that duck count. And it's not that we're going to see this huge build of drilled but uncompleted wells. It's just kind of that flat lining where then you start to balance things out because we went way too high in 2019, 2020. So now we're way too, uh, way too low. So again, we're going to kind of find that, that, that balance that is going to be needed to carry us through really the end of the year and more, more specifically into next year as, as well. So now when we start looking at, well, where is the oil going to go? You know, we're going to continue to produce. We're at about 11.87 million barrels a day, you know, a bumping up again against 11.9. We don't see this huge, this huge spike, but there's all this talk about, you know, uh, uh, you know, Russian crude and what Europe's going to do. So Europe is supposed to stop buying uh, Russian oil by, by May 15th in the U S there's that talk about April 22nd. So, but what are they replacing? How much is going to be replaced? And when you look at crude oil and condensate exports from Russia, you get an idea that there's about 2.2 million barrels a day of crude imported. And then there's about 1.2 million barrels a day of, uh, of condensate. So when you, uh, 1.2 million 
of crude, you know, so when you're looking at the different pieces, it's important to say, well, how do you replace it? You know, Germany's obviously one of the largest, you know, Poland, Italy, you have the Netherlands obviously in there as well. You know, can you do it? The answer is yes. There is more than enough crude in the market to replace Russian crude into the uh, into Europe, and and it's not because you know there's there's all this available, but Russia would sell into other places. Then where India and China normally buy, that would become available, and that would become uh, come over to to uh, to Europe. But there's some key pieces in that. One miles per ton is going to explode, which just means that it's going to take longer for the crude to get there. Two. Is there are there enough slips to to bring that crude in by water? Is there enough pipeline pointing in that direction to get it to Hungary and other places that are landlocked? Again, those are some of those key pieces when you start looking at these decisions on is it even possible to replace? So when you look at what what Russia has done, because even uh, again, uh, Europe is acting on their on their way of you know making sure that they're supporting Ukraine, reducing the amount of capacity going into uh, from Russia, but. Russia has no choice. They have to sell their oil. They only have eight days of storage at the current rate, as we've been highlighting, is about 50, 45 to 55 days. You know, the average is about 50 days at the current rate. So they have to increase their exports, which is when you look at the departures or Russian loading crude from the Baltic, Black Sea, and Arctic. You can see that, and based on what is happening so far, uh, China and India have been uh, have been stepping it up in in the Netherlands. And again, this is as of March twenty second, so that you know Netherlands will be coming down, but China and India is going up. And again, they're there. That's going to be where they're going to get those those deals. But then when you look at you know Ukraine uh, using two Neptune missiles was able to take down the uh, the uh, the flag flagship in the Black Sea, the Mo- uh, Moldova. When you look at that, you're all of a sudden like, you just took down something that has 64 S300s on it. And and that's also going to create some fear in terms of, well, okay, what does the Black Sea look like? When you look at the Black Sea, it's like, is it safe to be there? You know, you already had insurance rates exploding, day rates exploding, and now you have ships literally exploding. You know, what is that going to do? Or it, will anybody even insure it? Now, India and China, can they, their central banks can step in and, and backstop it. They don't really need an insurance uh, coverage. You know, the wrap can come from the central banks, but that's a risk. And, and again, I'm not saying that Ukraine would be looking to, to strike a vessel, but again, this is, this is a concern when you're looking at weighing all of your options in terms of the Black Sea. And because the uh, Turkey has cut, uh, shut off the straits to military vessels, you know, there's no way to replace that. So this also allows the Ukrainian air, uh, aircraft to move about a bit more freely because the because the vessel that was struck, you know, that was able to scan one third of the Black Sea. So you're talking about a huge advantage that has been shifted over to Ukraine. We do expect some retaliation, but again, we'll, we'll leave the geopolitics for next week. So when you start looking at Russian oil exports by destination, 29% uh, went to of uh, went to EU and 16% went to EU products. So you're talking about a huge contingent of capacity. So how do you replace so much given a lot of this was on pipe, if not all of it was going by boat? And this is why we've seen such a big shift in terms of getting it on the water, but they have to make sure that those uh, ports remain open. When you look at crude oil flows, Russia seaborne crude flows uh, rebound post-invasion. Again, that's not surprising when you start looking at where it is because they have to get it there. Well, now, this is as of uh, this is showing four million barrels a day. You know, when we look at the numbers that we talked about in the EIA show, they're right now targeting. I'm not saying that they've done it yet. But right now they're targeting between 4.2 and 4.4 million barrels a day of crude getting on the water because, again, they have to make sure that those shutdowns, those shut-ins don't happen because of, uh, of storage. So then when you look at the flowing east, it's not surprising to see more and more of it shifting to the far east. When you look at what is being what is going that direction, a lot of it is coming from the Black Sea because again, that's even though it's a longer distance, the discounts are there to incentivize these ships going from the Black Sea into uh, India and China. So again, all of these different things, it's not, it's obviously going to create different shortfalls depending on where you are, but it's also going to increase the miles per ton, which is going to increase the 
the cost of the barrels, which is going to increase the cost to the consumer and to the refiner, which obviously, again, always keeps leading down, which is why we're seeing wholesale prices go up, why we're seeing energy prices go up, why we're seeing inflation price uh, inflation the way it is. And that's when you start looking at the U.S. So when you look at the U.S., and, and again, when you look at retail sales, the expectation was for 0.6, came in at 0.5. Again, still positive, but slowing. And I think more importantly is the control group with the expectation of 0.1 came in at negative 0.1. So you're still seeing that that con- control group, you know, getting a slightly negative. And, and, and this is what we've been talking about. You know, as everyone we was for that have been following us, Europe to us is already in a recession. Lagarde said the same thing. It's not surprising to see that based on all of these shifts of, well, how do they replace Russian natural gas? And now how do they replace Russian diesel? How do they replace Russian oil? All of that requires a huge increase in price to do it. But when you look at the U.S., we import that, you know, so we're not at the point of, oh, the U.S. is in a recession. No, you can see that. The, our point is it's getting, the, the growth is slowing. The trend is down. And uh, another key piece, when you look at imports, import prices, import price index was expected to be at 11.9 year over year, came in at 12.5. You know, month over month was expected to be up 2.3%, was up 2.6%. We continue to import the inflation. And that's, I think, the key piece that when you look at some of the comments about where inflation is, where it's going, it's we're going to continue to import it. And we're exporting it. I'm not saying that we aren't because when you look at export price index, you know, it was expected to be up 2.2%, was up 4.5%. You know, year over year, it was up, uh, it was supposed to be up 16.2%, was up 18.1%. So you're continue to see this, uh, you know, happening as we're importing more inflation and pushing it out and exporting it. You know, when you look at business inventories, remember, as you see the um, the retail sales slow, inventories build, the expectation was to be up 1.3%. We were up 1.5%. You know, the Michigan sentiment had a nice bounce. You know, the sentiment was supposed to be at 59, came in at 65.7. Current conditions was expected at 67, came in at 68.1. So again, you're starting to see some of that balance. You know, jobless claims slightly higher, but still, you're, st- you're still seeing progress when you look at, uh, at the jobs market, which remains very tight. The biggest problem when you start looking at the inflation number, as we talked about previously, why we think that we have yet to see peak inflation is when you look at uh, you know one of the things, items with 4% price growth are now commonplace when you look at the percentage of goods that are increasing over 44%. You're talking about something that is almost 75 to 80% of goods are moving at a 4% clip. <coughs> Excuse me. U.S. inflation didn't just reach fresh four decades high at uh, at at eight point five percent, but when you start looking at the different breakdowns, gains of at least four percent from a year earlier is at seventy six percent. That's up from two thirds in February and less than five percent at the end of twenty nineteen. To give you an idea of where those pressure points are. So one of the bright spots in this is when you look at the numbers overall on a one month basis, they went the sticky CPI eased to 5.8% on a one month annualized percent change basis, second consecutive monthly easing and well below the spike saw in the 1970s and 80s. But some of the things that we're starting to see on the sticky side, which is when you look at, again, we had another surge in flexible, but then when you look at at what is happening here, crude prices are back up again. You're going to see, you know, uh, gasoline respond. You're going to see diesel respond. You know, those are things that never really came back down. Well, diesel, I shouldn't say. Uh, I should say, didn't really come back down. So this is additional pressure. So when you start looking at, okay, this is one month. Well, what about next month? Well, CP, uh, the food at, 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 the, at, at home up 10%, you know, core services up 4.7% and, and rising. So when you start looking at these core components, these core pieces, you're seeing a lot of these movements, especially when you look at the, the, the amount of goods moving at, a, at over a 4% clip. Take that to the next level. PPI, again, that leading indicator for food is up again at 16.2%. You're talking about the highest it's ever been, you know, at least uh, you know when you're looking at just the rate of change on just the cost of making the food and growing the food. And again, that's why we continue to see these pressure points on the sticky front. 
because that food piece, again, is going to get pushed through price. Now, the sticky price consu- uh, when the sticky price consumer price index, this is looking at a three month uh, at a three month piece, and it's over six percent, and and actually over seven percent. So when you look at these shifts. One, you know, you can take your different pieces. You can obviously spin it however bullish or bearish you want. We try to look at the whole package. And these are some of those leading indicators that we're concerned about, especially when you start looking at uh, PPI finished goods. You had that dip, and now you're having that reacceleration with finished goods surging to 15.2% year on year in March, surpassing the peak in 1980. And now it's the fastest since 1975. So that will translate down to that sticky front and, and kind of turn us back up and really move that one month annualized piece closer and then above 6%. Now, when you look at the uh, adjusted retail sales, you know, as we showed earlier, retail sales came in at 0.5%, estimate was for 0.6%. The one of the key pieces that we're looking at is, again, that slowdown, just that pace of and that rate of change as we continue to see some of those headwinds. Then when you look at the University of Michigan, again, you're bouncing off the lows, but it, it's nothing dies in a straight line. You know, you, you had the, the big shock, things weren't, uh, you know, you had wages getting a bit better because remember when you look at jobs, you know, typically people, uh, when they change jobs or it's for a higher pay or a, uh, an increase in title. And we've seen that, you know, typically between March and June are the key periods when you go to find a new job. So things we do, we did expect to see some bounce. Obviously, we think it trends back down, but we look at it, you know, look at it typically, you know, it's not a, it's not a straight line. It's who did you, uh, you know, what is the margin for error? Who'd you speak to? That's why when we look at this, we're always looking at multiple pieces because the consumer confidence index, uh, board index isn't as bad as University of Michigan. So typically there's, there's obviously that give back, which is why we look at so many different data points to kind of paint that broad picture to really look at what's happening. So again, things are slowing, things are getting a, a bit hairy on the, uh, on the economic side, but we're still in growth mode. We're still gonna p- print uh, you know, positive numbers. And then when you look, and as we talked about in segment one of the Econ Show, there's a broad shortage of, uh, of uh, commodities. I mean, that's a stagflation written all over it. And we have that great chart looking at the different storage levels, which is going to keep prices elevated on a commodity level, which is why we do expect to see activity uh, continuing to move up in the U.S., you know, getting to that 300 uh, frac spreads, likely pushing much closer to 325 as long as we can get the parts and the pieces needed. But again, those are things that we're going to continue to follow and talk about. So hopefully everyone has a great Easter and a great long weekend. And if you're going away next week, hopefully everyone has a fantastic uh, spring break. And if you need us, you know where to find us in the comments section on YouTube. And uh, last and, uh, you know, finally, our, our favorite, please have a great weekend. Have a happy Easter. And thanks for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network.